We'll receive the morning offering at this time. If our ushers will please come while they're coming. Our reports today, uh, the buses have no report. We didn't run the buses this morning. Uh, we did have 107 in Sunday school today. So glad for everybody that's here. And uh, thank the Lord that you could and would be here today on such a day as this. And uh, we have the promise that when we gather in his name, he'll meet with us. Amen. And uh, we're looking forward to his working in our midst today. We're glad for each one that's here. As we look to the Lord in prayer, asking his blessings on the offering today, we do invite you to have a part in it. Ask Dwayne, would you lead us in prayer, please? Amen. 
Amen. Appreciate the music today. If you have your Bible this morning, please turn to the Gospel of Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11 today. I realize that many of our people would have had great difficulty getting out today and some were not able to get out. Glad that God made it so you could get out and be here. And I'm glad you wanted to be here. Amen. And good to be in the Lord's house. And we're going to begin reading today in Mark chapter 11 and verse 12. You find your place if you're able to do so. We ask you to stand as we show our respect for the reading of God's holy word. I want to read verse 12 through 21 here. Mark chapter 11. Beginning in verse 12 it says, On the morrow when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. Speaking of Jesus. And seeing a fig tree afar uh, off, having leaves, he came, if haply he might find anything thereon. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. And Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. And they came to Jerusalem, and Jesus went into the temple, began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple, and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves, and would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. And he taught, saying unto them, Is it not written, My house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer? But ye have made it a den of thieves. And the scribes and chief priests heard it, and sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him, because all the people were astonished. At his doctrine. And when even was come, he went out of the city. And in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, calling to remembrance, saith unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursest is withered away. Let's pray. Father, today we thank you for your precious word, and I pray that your blessings will be upon the reading of your word. And I pray for your direction and help for the preaching of thy word today. I pray you would give me clarity of thought and strength of voice and the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And I pray you would give this people attentive hearts and minds to thy word and to the message from thy word. And I pray, Lord, that each of us would respond to thy word in the way you'd want us to today. I pray there be right decisions and renewed commitments and strengthening of hearts and lives of people here today. Work in our midst and on yourself by what you do. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, and please be seated. The passage of Scripture we've just read is Mark's account of the cursing of the fig tree and the cleansing of the temple. And these things took place the day after Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, the Sunday that today we call Palm Sunday, which was the Sunday just one week before Easter Sunday. This took place the day after that took place. The triumphal entry, of course, when they proclaimed Jesus as the Messiah and all of that, and yet this day after, he cursed the fig tree and he cleansed the temple. That happened on Monday, and then they saw the dead fig tree on Tuesday morning. And so lots going on in the life of Christ and his ministry in this last week of his life on earth before his crucifixion. In these two events, I think we see Uh, Two things that are very important to Jesus. And I'd like to emphasize those today as we go through this text. First of all, it's important to Jesus that his children bear fruit. It's important that his children bear fruit. It's also important to him that his house be clean and free from corruption. He wants his children to bear fruit. He wants his house to be clean and free uh, from corruption. And uh, the title of the message today is simply the fig tree and the temple. The fig tree and the temple. And if you'll notice here as we begin in verses 12 to 14, Jesus desires fruit. He desires fruit. He, he, uh, he desired uh, fruit from the fig tree. The Bible said it had leaves. And from what I've read about that, uh, it, it being early in the year, the, the fig trees that the leaves would uh, survive through the winter generally had figs on them. Uh, that uh, actually had uh, continued to grow because the leaves had stayed there even through the winter season. And uh, it, it had leaves. It, the figs should appear 
uh, uh, been on there at that time. And uh, what it was is, uh, the way we would put it is, the fig tree was pretending to have fruit. It gave the appearance, but there was no fruit there. It was pretending to have that fruit, and Jesus was hungry. The Bible says in verse 12, he wanted some figs. And he went up to the fig tree, and it gave the appearance of having fruit. It had no fruit on it, and Jesus cursed the fig tree. In verse 14, he said, no man... Uh, uh, will eat uh, fruit of thee hereafter and forever. And he, he said to the fig tree, you're pretending to have fruit. Uh, you, you don't have fruit, and so you're not going to have fruit. And he said, not from now on. And You know, as I read that and looked through that, we'll not get stuck here today, but in Romans chapter 11, verse 22, the Bible says, after he talked about sparing not the natural branch of Israel and so forth, in verse uh, 22 there, he said, Behold, therefore the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but, but toward thee goodness. He's talking about the goodness and the severity of God. You know, God is love. and God is merciful and God is gracious and God is long-suffering. But there are times God is severe in the eyes of men. You know, when God brings judgment, it can be very harsh. It, can, it, is, it is very difficult uh, to uh, face or endure the judgment of God. And Jesus cursed the fig tree. In this case, he said, uh, he said, you give the appearance. You're making believe here. You're like a hypocrite fig tree. And he brought judgment upon that fig tree. I just want to point out here, I think this is a, in just illustration wise, what it shows here, Jesus desires fruit from his children. He desires fruit from his children. In John chapter 15 and verse 8, even if you didn't read this passage and see that, Jesus said, herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. He told his disciples that his Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. There's Three kinds of fruit I want to mention here this morning that God wants us all to bear and we see in the Bible. In Matthew chapter 2 and uh, verse 8, Jesus told a group of people, he said, Bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance. And what he was saying there is, if you say you've repented, you need to bring forth actions that demonstrate that you have repented from your sin. Bring forth uh, fruits, meat for repentance, actions that demonstrate that you have repented. You know, there are a lot of people who profess to know Jesus Christ as Savior, and there has never been a difference in their lives. They've never showed, they've not given up any of their sinful practices. They've not given up any of their sinful habits. They've not in, got involved in, in faithfulness to God's house and faithfulness to ministry and so forth. There's no fruit. There's no, uh, there's no indication in their life other than that maybe they say that they repented and received Christ, there's no real indication that they have. And so the first kind of fruit that God, the Lord wants all of us to bear is fruit that is meat or that is appropriate or goes with repentance. Amen. Fruit that demonstrates repentance. And then, of course, there's the fruit of the Spirit. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, you need not turn there. But the Bible says the fruit of the Spirit, and by the way, the fruit of the Spirit is a, a spiritual life. It's the manifestation of a spiritual life. It's, it's what comes out of somebody who's spirit-filled and walks with the Lord. And of course, only Christians can be spirit-filled. The Bible says the fruit of the Spirit is love. It is joy. It is peace and long-suffering and gentleness, and goodness, and faith, and meekness, and temperance. It's the fruit of a spiritual life. Now, I'm not saying that if you're not manifesting every one of these uh, like a Christian ought to manifest, I'm not saying you're not a Christian. But what it's saying is you got some fruit missing. And by the way, that verse doesn't say the fruit's of the Spirit, it says the fruit of the Spirit. And all these are, this is nine different things that are listed there. But what it's saying is, if you're a spiritual, godly person, these things will come out of your life. Right. Yes. And uh, you'll have 
a love for other people. You'll have a love for lost souls. You'll have a love for your brothers and sisters in Christ. You'll have a love like you didn't have before. And you'll have a joy. The Bible calls it unspeakable. Amen. You'll have peace. That's the peace that passes understanding. Here's one we all need to uh, get up to speed on. It says long-suffering. Say, what does that mean? That means we put up with stuff. <laughs> long-suffering. You've probably noticed in your life that there's people that you really care about. They tend to get on your nerves sometimes. Isn't that true? There's people that you really care about that disappoint you. We could state it a whole bunch of different ways, but there are people that you care about that they don't act and behave like you'd always want them to. Long-suffering. Long-suffering. It means that uh, you still care about them and you're patient with them. The, spirit of, fruit, the fruit of the Spirit is long-suffering. It is gentleness. You know, I know there's difference in makeups and temperaments of people and all that. and Not always, but it's generally so that uh, uh, men tend to toward harshness. Women tend toward gentleness. You know, godly men are not harsh people. And when we are, we know we've been wrong in the way we've dealt with somebody, the way we've handled things. That doesn't mean we're not firm. doesn't mean we don't stand by what we know what's right. But it's gentleness and goodness and faith and meekness, which is the opposite of being proud and bolsterous. And temperance, that's self-control. Jesus desires fruit from his children. And then he desires not only spiritual fruit, like the way we live and what comes out of our lives, and fruit for, that's meat for repentance, but he also wants spiritual fruit in the lives of others as a result of our life and ministry. To bear fruit is to win somebody to Christ. To bear fruit is to edify a Christian and help build them up. To, to bear fruit is to be a, a, a consistent, effective mentor of younger Christians or people uh, in God's service and so forth, that's bearing fruit in the lives of others. It's the fruit of salvation in winning people to Christ. It's the fruit of edification. It's also the fruit of restoration. What I mean by that is restoring those that are, have been overtaken in a fault. The Bible says, ye which are spiritual. It talks about bringing them back in a spirit of meekness and such. The Lord wants fruit out of your life. He desires fruit from my life and from your life. You know, Jesus didn't just save us to have a good time. Although there's no life like the Christian life and the abundant Christian life and the joy and the peace and all of that, Jesus saved us because He loves us to save our soul, but He left us here to bear fruit. Amen. He wants you to bear fruit if you're a child of God. He desires fruit. Jesus also wants his house to be clean and pure. We talk about his house. In Old Testament times, the temple in Jerusalem was the house of God. Uh, and by the way, let me describe a little bit the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, for a long time when I thought of the temple, I just thought of a building. And uh, the temple in Jerusalem is everything that involves the, the, the temple uh, that uh, was there in Jerusalem. It, it sat upon the top of what is known as Mount Zion. The temple, what was called the temple, covered about 30 acres of ground. From what I've read about the temple. It was uh, in two parts. The temple was, first of all, the temple building. And that's what we think of when we think of the temple. By the way, the temple building... For a building that sat in the middle of 30 acres of ground was relatively small. From what I've read about the temple and understand about the temple, it's uh, not exactly the same, but it's pretty close to comparable to the inside of this auditorium right here in size. <coughs> to reconstruct it today the way it was constructed in Solomon's day would cost literally billions and billions of dollars. 
because of all the gold that was in it and, and the, the, the other things that were there. But it wasn't a huge building. It was a relatively small, uh, ornate building in the center of the property. In the temple, of course, was the holy place or what was called the Holy of Holies. It was a place where only the high priest uh, could enter and he only went there once a year on the Day of Atonement. But then out and around the temple is what was called the temple precincts or courtyards. And there were four of those. The first one was the courtyard or the court of the priests. And of course, uh, that's where the priests could go. And that was immediately around the temple building. There was the court of the Israelites where it was a huge courtyard where the Jews gathered on the great feast days where all the males, the men and boys of Israel were supposed to gather there three times a year for the three major uh, feast times. And so it was, a, it was a very large courtyard where they would all gather. It was a place where they would present sacrifices to be offered by the priests and that's where they offered them was there in, in the court of the Israelites. And then there was the court of the women, <laughs> sorry ladies, that was outside the court of the Israelites. And women could only enter the court of the Israelites on feast days or to present a sacrifice to the priest. They could go there, but it had to be for the specific reason. And then outside of all of it, surrounding all of it, is what was called the court of the Gentiles. And it was for Gentile converts to Judaism. And that's where they could enter into, and they were really not supposed to go beyond that. Well, when it says that Jesus entered the temple, it was in the court of the Gentiles. And so just picture in your mind, this building sitting in the middle of 30 acres, that's a pretty good plot of ground there, and you've got these three courts that go out from it, and a couple of those are very large, and then outside all that was the court of the Gentiles, and that's where Jesus was uh, when he rebuked the people. This is where he displayed his anger and uh, talked about uh, making it a den of thieves. I have to admit, I used to think about people right there inside the temple building and buying and selling and so forth. And the truth is, God would very likely have struck them dead right there because that was the place of the Holy of Holies. They were way out beyond that, but it was still part of what was considered God's temple. And that's where he drove the money changers out of the temple. They were selling animals for sacrifice on the feast days. By the way, it was a very lucrative business for them. You know, when you think about it, uh, people, the Israelites from all over the realms where they would come from, they would travel uh, sometimes great distances to get there for the national feast holidays and sacrifice and all that, it made sense that they didn't always bring their livestock with them that they were going to sacrifice because of the journey. But what had happened is it wasn't set up out there as a service for those who couldn't bring their own. It was set up there to make a lot of money. It was set up there to take advantage of people. You know, when you would get there, you came there to offer a sacrifice you had to have a sacrifice, so you would have to buy it from them. And the ones running it were taking advantage of the others. And Jesus, uh, of course, didn't like that. And in verse 16, he also stopped people from using the courtyard as a road or a thoroughfare. Look in verse 16 that we've already uh, read there, where, where we started today in, in uh in our text, and it talks about the fact that, oh, I know I'm not finding I'd turn pages here. It says here that in verse 16 it says, and would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. And it's not like they were coming up to the temple building and going in one door and out the other. It's like it was on the outer part of this 30 acres, and people were walking through the area that was known as the court of the Gentiles as a shortcut to other parts of the city. By the way, I can relate to that. I see people taking shortcuts through here a lot. <laughs> but I don't think the Lord cares about that. But this was sacred holy ground. Of all places on the earth, this was sacred holy ground. And they were walking through there. 
and uh, they were cutting across there as a shortcut. And I'll get back to this in a minute, but notice they were going through the court of the Gentiles. I mean, it was just the court of the Gentiles. And so they were walking back and forth. And we're not talking about necessarily the Romans doing that. We're talking about Israelites, God's people doing that. And he stopped them from doing that. And he said in verse 17, my house shall be called, he said, of all nations. That is, this is the reputation that I want my house to have among all nations. It's called the house of prayer. What he was saying is it's a, it's a place of reverence. It's a place of worship. It's a place to praise God and make sacrifices to God. And it's a place to serve God. Just put it in short terms, this is a holy place. It's not for secular activities. It's not to wear a path across here on the way to someplace else. You go around. It's a place of prayer. By the way, prayer is a sacred thing. Your own prayer life ought to be a time of reverence between you and the Lord. Your reverence toward God. And when we're in the house of God and somebody's leading in prayer, by the way, that's just not thinking, well, what are we going to call it? We'll call it leading in prayer. We talk about leading in prayer because as one person words the prayer, we ought to be in our hearts praying with that person. Whether it's the start of a service or at the end of a service or during the service, we ought to be agreeing with them in prayer. Prayer is a sacred. You say, why are you saying? We ought not to be looking around. We ought not to be taking, uh, sending notes or texts or anything like that. We ought to be praying. It's a sacred thing. It's a time of faith and trust in the Lord. And Jesus said it should be called a house of prayer. But you've made it a den of thieves. The priests were taking advantage of the Jewish pilgrims who came there. The high prices for animals that were necessary for worship and probably unfair exchange rates and such as that. Notice their sin was they had secularized the house of God. They had taken advantage of people by their greedy, dishonest, unfair practices. And in a sense, and this is, this is real central in this, in a sense they were saying the Gentiles don't matter. Because after all, this is just the court of the Gentiles. Do you follow what I'm saying? You know, yeah, we got to set up somewhere. Got to have all this livestock here. We got to have the lambs and so forth. We need, well, let's just do the court of the Gentiles and make a corral out of it and so forth. And we'll set up our tables and, and this is where we'll do our business. Because really, you know, the Gentiles don't matter anyway. I'm glad the Gentiles matter to God, aren't you? Amen. Matter of fact, Mark this down and don't ever forget it. Everybody matters to God. Amen. I'm very clear on this. I know I've got this right. Jesus died on the cross for everybody. Amen. You know, if a church is what it's supposed to be, thank God there are churches that are what they're supposed to be. Whether you're among the socially and economically elite or you're among those that are the poorest of the poor and you've got all kinds of difficulties and problems in your life, this is a place to come and get right with God. Amen. This is a place to come and worship and serve God. Because everybody matters. Young people, will you remember this? If there's somebody in your neighborhood or your school or whatever you're involved in, that the other kids make fun of, they're not a target for you because they matter. Amen. Good. And I know that's something easy to fall into. If somebody is someone that other people make fun of, that doesn't make it right for you to make fun of them. Amen. Right. And if, somebody, if there's somebody that other people neglect and, and leave out and all that thing, it doesn't mean you ought to ne neglect them and leave them out. Amen. And not so young people. Applies to us too, doesn't it? It's something to learn at an early age in our life. Everyone matters to God. The Bible says he's no respecter of persons. Jesus wants his house to be clean and pure. 
There was the Old Testament temple. He wanted to be clean and pure. Now the New Testament church is also the house of God. In 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15, Paul wrote to Timothy and talked about that thou mayest know how to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. He said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. That was not just the Old Testament temple. That's the New Testament church. It's God's house. And he wants it to be clean and pure. pure. You know, we should respect the buildings. I've said this so many times before. I know that this building is made out of the same stuff that houses are made out of. You know, it's, it's blocks and concrete and brick and mortar and wood and drywall and, those kind, and, and, and electrical uh, lines and all that kind of thing. And it's not sacred because what it's made out of. It's sacred because of what it's made for. It's the house of God. It's the place where people come and pray and worship and hear the word of God and hopefully heed the word of God. Over these many years as pastor, it doesn't happen all the time, thank goodness. It doesn't happen every week. It doesn't even necessarily happen every month. But there's many times I've called kids down say, don't you be running in these halls. And don't you be scuffling and fighting around here in these halls. I came in here recently, and I don't even remember who it was, so you're not busted here. But I came in here, and the old thing where you hold your hand and doing that in the auditorium, you know, this isn't a place to do that. This is the house of God. Amen? You say, well, church wasn't going on, but the church still is. This is not a place for that. Not a place for tag and all that. And by the way, say, so yeah, get them, preach. Get those kids. It's not a place to be doing other things either. Amen? Amen. Place to come and focus on God and the things of God. I usually don't turn my phone off. I just turn it down. And I've been here when somebody else is preaching and I feel it vibrate. And there's a temptation to see what that is. But I don't do it. And it's not just because you'll see me. I don't think the Lord wants us to do that. Amen. It's a place to focus on the things of God. Shall we call it a house of prayer? Show reverence in the services. Guard and protect the purity of the body, not just the building now, the purity of the body. As a child of God and as a member of this church, you're part of this body. And how you live and what you do and so forth, it matters. We'll not go all into that today. And then, of course, the house of God is the Old Testament temple and the New Testament church, but it's also our bodies. The Bible says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. You've heard me give it many times before. In 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 19, he says, What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? For ye are bought with the price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Our bodies, are, the Bible says, the temple of the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost is God. It's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The three make up the Godhead, three in one. Our bodies, we belong to God. Our body and our spirit belong to God. We, it says in this passage in verse 18, before I started reading there, it says, flee fornication. Fornication is impure sexual acts. We should not only flee fornication, we should flee all kinds of sin. The church and the individuals make it up. God wants us to be clean and pure and he wants us to bear fruit. Now notice the response of the people in verse 18. When he cleansed the temple, the scribes and chief priests sought how they might destroy him. <laughs> they didn't like it a bit. But they feared him because the people 
looked up to him. You know, they eventually, I put it in quotes, they destroyed him by spreading lies about him. You know, they brought false witness against him before Pilate. They told lies about him to the Israelites and they were crying out, let him be crucified. They destroyed him by spreading lies. And I just say this and move on. Beware of trying to hurt or destroy a good person. Amen? Amen. You'll answer to God for that. Beware of trying to destroy or hurt a good person. You know, they lied about Jesus, tortured him and mocked him, and they will answer to God. They'll answer to Jesus for that. Potiphar's wife lied about Joseph. uh, Joseph's brothers lied about Joseph. They had a pretty rough time when they went to Israel to get grain, didn't they? They ended up being scared for their lives for sure. Beware of that in your own life. About trying to hurt somebody who's trying to do right. And when I say a good person, I know none of us are good compared to God. But somebody who's a genuine, sincere person in their life trying to do right, you beware of trying to hurt somebody. By the way, you know people who are genuine and sincere still make mistakes? And sometimes those mistakes are sins. Help them to deal with it and get right with God. Rather than trying to hurt them. The people were astonished by his doctrine. The Bible says in verse 18, Jesus spoke with authority. By the way, when Jesus spoke, he made sense. What he said was true and what he said was practical and what he said was fair. By the way, He was much smarter than the Jewish leaders. He showed that over and over again. He was smarter than the high priests. He was smarter than the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Herodians and the scribes and all the rest of them. And by the way, he would be. He knows it all. He did then and he still does. The people were astonished. He spoke with authority. And then in verse 20, let's move on. I know we've talked a lot about the temple. Our time's about gone. Notice the withered fig tree in verse 20. When they came back through, it was dried up from the roots, which means it was totally dead. You know, that's a picture of the unsaved in in Jude and verse 12. Say which chapter? There's only one, okay? Jude and verse 12. Speaking of the... the, uh, the people who disobeyed God and even the religious crowd, he said, these are spots in your feasts of charity. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds. Trees whose fruit withered, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. The withered fig tree, I think that's describing people who are illustrated by this dead fig tree. That dried up from the roots. That means totally dead. You know, you can cut a tree down, and if you band it and and take care of it and the roots are still alive, it'll shoot sprouts out of it and eventually sometimes grow a tree back. It's possible to do that. But when the roots are dead, it's gone. It's over. It's not coming back. Said twice dead in Jude, verse 12. That's a picture of the unsaved. You know, the Bible, not the Bible, but life tells us, and from Bible teaching we see, uh, you're either, uh, if you're born only once, you're going to die twice. You're going to die physically, and then you'll experience the second death, which is eternal separation from God in the lake of fire. Twice dead. If you're saved, you've been born twice. Been born physically, and then you've been born again into the family of God, and if you're saved, you're going to die once. These bodies will die, but we'll be alive forevermore with Jesus Christ. Born twice, only the physical death to face at the end of this life. It says plucked up by the roots there in Jude 12. Plucked up by the roots. You know all of us will be plucked up someday. <laughs> We'll be plucked up from this life. We'll be plucked up from all that we have in this world. We'll stand before God. 
It's also a picture of false professors, people who profess to be Christian. Mark eleven thirteen 13, he's talking about leaves but no figs. It gave the appearance of having life or fruit, but it didn't. Jude 12 uh, describes the false professors as this way. And I'm not talking about a professor like a college teacher. I'm talking about somebody who professes or claims something. Clouds without water. Trees without fruit. What I call that is profession without possession. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of people who are religious, whether they're religious in being faithful to a certain religious gathering or not. Many are that way and they're not saved. And many people are religious and they'll talk about the good Lord this and the good Lord that and how they believe and all this. But they've never personally received Jesus Christ as personal Savior. False professors. They got leaves. They're clouds, but there's no water in the clouds. Thank God when you get saved, there's water in the clouds. Thank God when you really get saved, fruit comes out of that life that's a spiritual fruit that honors the Lord. We're not just talking about being religious now. We're talking about the fruit of the Spirit and the fruit in the lives of others. Fruit, meat for repentance. The two main thoughts of the message today is Jesus requires that his children bear fruit. When you bear fruit as a Christian, fruits, meat for repentance, the fruit of the Spirit, fruit in the lives of others, that's evidence you are a Christian. It's proof of your love for him. It also is demonstration of his power and of his favor. Every Christian life ought to demonstrate a measure of the power of God in that life. Jesus requires that his children bear fruit. I'll come back to that when I'm done. I'm almost. He wants his house to be clean and pure. He wanted the Old Testament temple that way. He wants the New Testament church that way. He wants individual Christians to have a right heart and a right spirit and to be morally clean and to live by pure motives. He wants that. And I would say today in closing, please don't be found to be a tree without fruit. One of the things that I've always uh, been concerned about is my prayer is that people who are a part of this church are truly saved. You know, I can talk to people and say, are you saved? And go through it and they say, yes, I am. You need to be sure in your heart that you have by faith received Jesus Christ, your personal Savior. 